Dr. Jason Lyle graduated summa cum laude from Ohio Wesleyan University, where he double majored in physics and astronomy and minored in mathematics. He did graduate work at the University of Colorado, where he earned a master's degree and a PhD in astrophysics. In Dinosaurs and the Bible, Jason shows clearly and convincingly how the foundational truths of the Word of God can help us uncover many of the mysteries of our age, including dinosaurs. In this fascinating video, viewers will discover that contrary to popular belief, dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago, but were in fact the contemporaries of man. Dr. Lyle challenges his audience to embrace the truth of Scripture and the salvation message contained within its pages. Well, thanks again for coming out. I am Dr. Jason Lyle, a speaker and research scientist with Answers in Genesis. And I want to talk to you today about dinosaurs and the Bible. And I have to admit that this is a really fun talk for me because I've always loved dinosaurs since I was a little kid. And we find that most kids really get excited about dinosaurs. Now, a lot of people actually equate dinosaurs with evolution because our culture has used dinosaurs in an attempt to get people to believe in millions of years of evolution. But what I want to show you today is that when you start from the Bible, Dinosaurs make a lot of sense, and in fact, we can actually use dinosaurs to get people excited about the Bible really being the Word of God and really giving us the true account of history. And I found that this is just a great way to evangelize, especially to youngsters who get interested in God's Word through science, really. Now, a lot of the times when I do these talks on creation, one of the questions that I get asked is, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And my answer to that question, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible, is actually you don't. Because when people are asking, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible, they're really asking, how do I fit what I know about dinosaurs into the Bible? How can I make it fit? How can I interpret God's Word to allow for dinosaurs? You see, that's the wrong direction, isn't it? We don't want to start with what we know to be true, what we think we know to be true, and fit that back into God's Word. Not at all. We want to start with the Word of God. We're going to use the Bible to explain dinosaurs. We start with the Bible. That's the, that's the premise. That's the way to start. You see, we all have a way of looking at evidence. We can either look at the world through evolutionized glasses, millions of years of slow, gradual processes, or we can look at it through what God has said about the world. We can look at it through the lens of Scripture. And how we look at the evidence will be affected by our views of the past. If we think that the world evolved slowly over millions of years, that's what we're going to tend to see in the same way that a person wearing red glasses sees red everywhere. It's not that the world is red, it's that that's what they see because they're wearing those glasses. Well, if we think in terms of millions of years of slow, gradual processes, that's how we're going to interpret the data. But if we start from Scripture, if we start from the true history that God himself has given us, an eyewitness to creation after all, then we're thinking in terms of biblical history. God created the universe, creation. It was a paradise. It was a perfect world, and he gave us dominion over that world and said, you can either be for me or against me, and we effectively rebelled against God, said we want to play by our own rules, and that was the corruption. Sin entered that world and ruined paradise. God then judges sin in the catastrophe, Noah's flood. God judges sin. He's righteous, but he made a way of escape for Noah and for anyone who would trust in him. Then there was confusion, the confusion of tongues of the Tower of Babel. The people had united in rebellion against God, and so God divided them up into the various people groups. And then Christ, God himself, took on the additional nature of a human being, stepped into history, and paid the penalty for sin on the cross. And in the future, the final sea of history, consummation, the world will once again be a paradise in the future because of what Christ did on the cross. So if you're thinking in terms of biblical history, if we start from Scripture, 
what can we conclude about dinosaurs? Well, again, I like to think about this like wearing mental glasses. We call these the biblical reality glasses. When we look at dinosaurs, what do we see starting from Scripture? So put on your biblical reality glasses, and let's see what we can conclude about dinosaurs starting from Scripture. Well, dinosaurs, they're land animals by definition. They're reptiles that walked on their legs. Therefore, they were created on day six of the creation week. And we know that from Genesis 1, 24, and 25. Starting from Scripture, we know that the land animals, all the land animals, that would include the dinosaurs, were made on day six. And this is a very basic form of logic called a syllogism. Follow this. T-Rex is a land animal. Land animals and man were created on day six. Therefore, T-Rex was created on day six. That's pretty easy, isn't it? And so dinosaurs, therefore, are not millions of years old. They lived beside man, contrary to what we've been taught. Dinosaurs lived with people. So maybe it looked something like this. But uh, <laughs> in any case, people say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You, got, you got a T-Rex in the Garden of Eden. Wouldn't that T-Rex try to eat Adam and Eve? I mean, I've seen Jurassic Park, and they look pretty mean. See, a lot of people get their ideas about how animals behaved, surprisingly, from Hollywood fiction, which I find rather sad, really. People think that God made these horrible monsters because they see, they see Hollywood fiction. But if you think about it, is Hollywood really trying to tell an accurate story or is it trying to tell an entertaining story? That's really what it's trying to do, isn't it? And if you think about it, if dinosaurs had survived until today, but instead the elephant had gone extinct, I suspect we might go to Jurassic Park and sit down and watch the movie and we would see elephants in it. <laughs> Because if we didn't know how elephants behaved, they might have been perceived as monsters. And you'd see, people, you'd see these elephants rushing around, stabbing people with their tusks and crushing them with their trunk throughout the whole movie. Because what else would tusks possibly be used for except stabbing its prey? And they're sharp and they're pointy. Of course that's what they were used for, right? Well, no. No, not at all. And in fact, elephants, can, they're, they're gentle animals. Now, you don't want to make one mad, but at the same time, they're not, they're not monsters. They're not monsters. They're just animals that God created for our enjoyment, really. And so dinosaurs are the same way. They're not monsters. They're just animals that God created. You can't tell the behavior of an animal by its bones anyway, any more than you could tell the behavior of me from my bones. You could make a guess, but it's just a guess. It's all it is. We know from Scripture that God wouldn't make monsters because the world was a paradise when it was first created. Dinosaurs aren't monsters. They're just animals, animals that God created. And in any case, we know that those fossils can't be millions of years old because death entered the world after Adam sinned. So those dinosaur fossils that we find had to have been after Adam sinned. So they were definitely in the world at the time of Adam. There's no doubt about it. Made on day six, lived with people, not monsters. People say, oh, but those, those fossils are millions of years old. But again, fossils don't come with little labels telling you how old they are. Not at all. Is there any scientific evidence that dinosaurs have lived recently and not millions of years ago? Well, there is. Did you know that we found evidence of dinosaur red blood cells up in Montana? Red blood cells from a T-Rex. And, and more recently, we found evidence of soft tissue in a T-Rex, again, up in Montana. Really amazing. Looks like blood vessels, and they're still spongy and soft. Amazing. Not millions of years old. Certainly not 68, 69 million years old. Not at all. Much more recent. But ultimately, we know from, from Scripture that they didn't live millions of years ago. That's how we ultimately know. This is evidence that's consistent with what the Bible teaches. But what do dinosaurs eat? <laughs> so we've got a T-Rex here. What's he thinking about? Is he thinking about eating animals? Let's put it like this. What did the first Tyrannosaurus Rex eat? He had teeth up to six inches long, serrated fangs. What did he eat? Well, was he a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, plant and a meat eater? How many say plant eater? Okay, how many say meat eater? How many say scavenger? How many say plant and meat eater? Okay, we got a, we got a pretty good group here. The, uh, the correct answer is he was a plant eater because we know that from Scripture. How do we know that? Genesis 1, 29 and 30. He would, the, the first T-Rex would have eaten plants because all the animals originally ate plants. If we read Genesis 1, 29 and 30, God's speaking to Adam and Eve. And, uh, and God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Verse 30, and to every beast of the earth. And to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. The dinosaurs, including the T-Rex, originally ate plants. By the way, they couldn't have eaten meat, because when you eat meat, you're eating a dead thing. I hate to break it to you, but you are eating a dead thing. And there was no death before Adam's sin. So, of course, they would have eaten plants originally. Now, at some point, some of the dinosaurs might have started eating meat, but that would have been after sin. Anyway, originally they would have eaten plants. Dinosaurs were originally vegetarian, as were all animals, according to Scripture. It's an implicit teaching of Scripture. So the first T-Rex is thinking about plants. People say, well, wait a minute. T-Rex has those incredibly sharp teeth. 
And indeed, T-Rex had six inch serrated fangs, perfectly designed for ripping and tearing into cantaloupes and watermelons and all kinds of plants. You see, some plants require sharp teeth anyway. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to bite into a coconut? Have you ever thought about that? See, we need something like a knife, something like a sharp tooth to cut it open to get to the soft stuff on the inside. But if you think about it, there are some plants that require sharp teeth to eat. And there are lots of animals today that have sharp teeth that eat only or primarily plants. Look at this primate. Look at those teeth. Well, but that guy got picked on in school. Look at that. <laughs> My goodness. You know, he eats primarily plants. Here's a skull. Look at the sharp teeth on that skull. What do you think this animal ate? Well, I gave you, I'll give you a clue. This is the skull of a fruit bat. What do you think a fruit bat eats? Fruit. fruit. How about that? You see how easy it is being a creationist? It's not hard. Now, again, at some point after sin, some of the animals must have started eating meat because some of them eat meat today. So at some point after sin, they would have converted. But if you think about it, even today, some animals go back to their pre-fall diet. Did you know that? We have an example of a lion, little tyke, which is a 350-pound female lion, who would not eat meat. Beautiful animal, but she refused to eat meat. They would try to give her meat, but she doesn't want it. But she does like milk. <laughs> Kind of fascinating, isn't it? And that reminds us of verses like Isaiah 11:7, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. It's something that the Bible indicates. Well, why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible then? If the Bible tells us some things implicitly about dinosaurs, like they, they were made on day six, and they lived beside people, and they, they maybe became meat-eating after sin, some of them, but originally they were vegetarian. Well, why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? It's a question I get a lot, but there's a very easy answer for that. The word dinosaur is a modern word. It was invented in 1841, coined by Richard Owen, who's a creationist, by the way, whereas the King James Version of the Bible was translated in 1611. The word dinosaur did not exist when the King James Bible was translated, so of course you're not going to find the word dinosaur in the Bible. But you will find the word dragon in the King James Bible. And in fact, the Hebrew word for that is tanin. It occurs 27 times in the Old Testament that I've been able to find. If you think about what a dragon is, it's basically a dinosaur. And some of the legends of dragons might be distorted versions of dinosaurs, really. Here are the different occurrences of the Hebrew word tanin in the Bible. And in most places, it's translated dragon. There are a few places where it's not translated dragon, but even there, maybe it should be as well. And I think this, this word tanin refers to any sort of, uh, anything like a dinosaur, anything similar like a plesiosaur, for example, that would also be classified under this word. And maybe some things like snakes as well. It's kind of a generic word. Well, there's, are there some specific references to dinosaurs in the Bible, specific kinds? Well, I think there are. If we take a look in Job chapter 40, starting with verse 15, we read about a creature called behemoth. It's the Hebrew word behemoth, beast, beast of beasts. And it just, it, it, if you read the description of it, it sounds an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur, one of the dinosaurs that had the very long neck and long tail and broad body, four legs. Look now at behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. You know, that's a really good description of a, of a diplodocus. The name Diplodocus means double bean, referring to the long muscles along its belly to support its very long neck and very long tail. Verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. He's got a tail like a, like a cedar tree. Really amazing. Uh, verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Only God could attack this creature. That's how powerful it is. That's how impressive it is. Now, a lot of people have said, well, you know what? Behemoth really can't be a dinosaur. And, they, and I find that they say that not because the description doesn't fit, but because of their preconception that people and dinosaurs didn't live together, and therefore Job couldn't possibly have seen a dinosaur. And therefore they'll say things like, well, behemoth probably is just an elephant. But if you read the description, does it really fit the description of an elephant? Not really. Does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? Not at all. An elephant has a tail like a little rope, not a tail like a cedar tree. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. I can't prove to you that behemoth is a dinosaur, but I can prove to you it's not an elephant because the description doesn't fit. And it's unfortunate. A lot of Bibles, actually, in the, in the footnotes, they'll say things like, you know, behemoth, have a little footnote, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. But folks, something to remember, the footnotes in your Bible are not inspired. <laughs> something to remember. It's the text that's inspired. It's clearly not an elephant or hippopotamus. They don't have a tail like a cedar tree. But if we read the next chapter of Job, we read about a creature called Leviathan, which sounds an awful lot like a plesiosaur, an aquatic reptile. Not a true dinosaur, because true dinosaurs uh, walked with their legs. They had legs. So this creature had flippers and swam in the ocean. If we read the description of Leviathan, it sounds an awful lot like a plesiosaur, some kind of plesiosaur, perhaps, or another kind of marine reptile. In any case, it's an enormous creature. And if you read the description of it, it really is an astonishing, an astonishing creature. And there are even verses, I didn't put all of them up there, 
But there are even verses that talk about it, sparks of flame leaping out of its mouth and smoke going out of its nostrils. Not only does it sound like a dragon, it sounds like a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> and a lot of people say, well, wait, could that possibly be true? This has got to be a metaphor or something. Well, this section of Job is referring to real creatures. If we read it in context, God is comparing his power to lots of creatures that Job is familiar with. It's not a metaphor. It's a real creature. But could it really breathe flame? Well, it's not a problem as far as I can tell. It's not a problem that God could make an animal that can breathe fire. I mean, think of the other amazing creatures that God's created, like the bombardier beetle, which has a couple of chemicals in its abdomen that it can mix together with a catalyst and it can create a very hot, almost a flame out of its backside to protect it from predators. Amazing creature, very intelligently designed. Or think about an electric eel. If you just found the fossil of an electric eel, just the skeleton, would you ever know that it could generate electricity? Probably not. You'd probably never realize that, that it had that amazing ability that God endowed it with. Well, I think God could endow creatures with the ability to, to breathe fire if he wanted to. In fact, most animals produce methane anyway, which is a flammable gas. If you just had a way to ignite it, you could do it. It's not a problem. What about flying reptiles? Flying reptiles like pterodactyl. Does the Bible mention things like that? Well, you know it does. In verses like Isaiah 14, 29, it talks about a fiery flying serpent. Isaiah 36, a fiery flying serpent. The word fiery there might mean the the, the, the sort of coppery in color, it can also mean poisonous. And it sounds an awful lot like a Rampharynchus, or perhaps a pterodactyl, but probably a Rampharynchus, one of the smaller flying reptiles that had the long tail and relatively small. So the Bible definitely talks about dinosaur-like creatures, no, no question of it. And it tells us implicitly that they were made on day six. Well, the next question then I get is, were there dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, and would they fit? And this is where the critics say, ah, oh, I got you here. No way could you possibly fit dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. No way, because dinosaurs are so big, can't, can't fit. But then you've got to ask the critic two questions. How big was the Ark, and how many animals, including the dinosaurs, had to go on it? And if you do these calculations, you'll find it's not a problem. You see, the Ark was very big. The Bi- we don't have to guess. The Bible tells us 300 cubits by 50 by 30. We don't know exactly how big a cubit was, but we do know at minimum it would be 17 and a half inches, which means the smallest possible Ark would be 437 feet by 73 by 44 feet tall. It was enormous. Could have been a little bit bigger than that as well. It was huge. See, people have misconceptions about the ark. They have, and I'm sorry to say the church sometimes is responsible for some of these misconceptions by painting little pictures like this, little bathtub arcs, and they're all cutesy and everything, and all the animals are packed on there, and they're all happy and smiling, even though the world's being destroyed. But uh, in any case, see, the real ark was enormous had the same capacity as 522 railroad stock cars. We need to get out of, the, out of our minds these, these silly little bathtub arcs and, and get the biblical ark in our mind. You can imagine Noah's surprise if he had the design, if God gave him the design for the, the little <laughs> bathtub ark, he'd be pretty shocked, wouldn't he? And by the way, Noah didn't have to design the ark, he just had to build it. God designed the ark. God told Noah the specifications for it. And uh, little bathtub arcs like that tip over very easily, but no, the, the, the real ark, the ark that God designed, was designed for stability and seaworthiness. It was optimally designed to weather a flood, really. So the ark was absolutely enormous. But was it big enough? How many animals would you have to go on it, including those dinosaurs? Would those dinosaurs fit? Well, keep in mind, folks, we don't need to put two deer hounds and dachshunds and two Dalmatians, two lion dogs. We certainly don't need poodles on board the ark, right? (laughs) No, all you need is two, what? Two dogs. That's all you need. Because you can get all these different breeds from two dogs. What's well, the same way with the dinosaurs? You don't need two Triceratops, two Leptoceratops, two Pinosaurus, two Monoclonius. You don't need all those, all those different, what are probably breeds, but in any case, we think they're all the same Genesis kind. So you just need two Ceratopsians, two of that kind of dinosaur. And so although there are over 600 dinosaur names, we think there are only about 50 Genesis kinds, and you can get a lot of those different breeds afterwards. So only about 100 dinosaurs on board the Ark. But would they fit? Would you, how could you get those big dinosaurs on the Ark? Well, keep in mind, Although some dinosaurs got very big, most of them were very small, like little Compsognathus, which is about the size of a chicken. So dinosaurs, average size might have been the size of a sheep or pony, something like that. They weren't that big on, on average. Now, there were a few kinds that got pretty big, like the, like the big sauropods, and those tended to get very, very big. But if you think about it, even the largest sauropod dinosaur started out very small because dinosaurs laid eggs. The largest eggs we find are about this big. It turns out you can't make an egg bigger than that anyway, physically. Because if you, as you make the egg bigger, you have to make the shell thicker to support its own weight. And then if you make the shell too thick, you can't get oxygen into it. So you can't make an egg bigger than a certain size. Physically, it doesn't work. So, of course, the dinosaur eggs couldn't be much bigger than that, which means the first, when the dinosaurs first hatched, how big were they? About this big. <laughs> they got to fit in that egg. So the, even the largest sauropods started out very small. 
Now, the only purpose for having the animals on board the ark was to preserve their kinds. All they had to do was reproduce after the flood. So do you think God would have taken the oldest and largest dinosaurs? Not at all. Why would he take senior citizens when he could take just these young ones, right? <laughs> it makes sense if their only purpose is to reproduce after the flood. So if we add it up, the mammals, well, the mammals take there are about 7,000 kinds. If we estimate the number of kinds, birds, maybe 4,000 to 5,000 reptiles, including the dinosaurs, uh, 3,000 to 4,000 reptiles. We add them up, about 16,000 animals on board the ark, only 100 of which are dinosaurs. We calculate the space available. We know the space available, the Bible tells us. We estimate the space required from each of the kinds. Birds don't take up too much space because they're small. Mammals take up the most because they're the most of them. The reptiles, including the dinosaurs, only take up about 15% of the ark, maybe 16%. So the animals would have taken up about half of the ark, about half. And you say, well, what's the other half for? Well, not only for people, but also for food. They had to put food on board the ark. And I think there was room for more people on board the ark. Now, God knew which people would re reject him, but from our perspective, so that he, he would say that, you know, he didn't decline salvation to anyone. He might have made it big enough for more people as well. So there's plenty of room, plenty of room on board the ark. Not a problem to get those dinosaurs on board the ark, especially if uh, Noah had taken youngsters, young adults. By the way, God called the animals. God caused the animals to come. Two of every kind will come to thee, the Bible says. So if dinosaurs got on board the ark, they must have gotten off the ark. So did dinosaurs survive the flood? Well, they must have. Now, granted, the flood killed off almost everything, but there were representative kinds of all the air-breathing land animals on board the ark. And so that means the dinosaurs, as Genesis kinds, would have survived the flood. Of course, most of the fossils we find would have been deposited during the flood, the dinosaurs that weren't on board the ark. That being the case, would you expect to find some legends of dinosaurs in history? Keeping in mind, they're not going to be called dinosaurs. That's a modern word. But would we find legends of dragons? Do we find legends of dragons? You bet. We find lots of legends of dragons, like the legend of St. George and the dragon. The legend goes that St. George came into this town. The town was being victimized by a dragon that was eating their livestock, and they were actually going to sacrifice a lady to this dragon, hoping to appease it. St. George rides in, slays the dragon, and saves the lady, converts the town to Christianity. People say, oh, that's just a myth. Well, maybe. On the other hand, maybe this was a real creature that he came in and killed. Maybe it was a dinosaur. We've actually found fossils of baryonyx, a sort of a type of dinosaur in that region. Do you know that Marco Polo, in AD 1271, reported that the Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons? In the year 1611, the, the Chinese uh, emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder, which hardly makes sense if there were no dragons to feed, doesn't it? <laughs> 1611, not that, not that long ago, really. Not, certainly not millions of years ago. And there are lots of legends of various dragons. There's a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The animal is described as being larger than an ox and had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. Sounds a little bit like a triceratops, doesn't it? Around the year 900, there was an Irish writer who recorded an encounter with a large animal. The creature had a head shaped somewhat like a horse's and had iron on its tail that pointed backwards. It had thick legs and strong claws. The description matches known dinosaurs such as Stegosaurus and Kentrosaurus. Can't be sure, but it sure sounds like one. This one's a really well-documented case. And, and on May 13th, 1572, around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, there was an Italian peasant who was walking behind his cart. His oxen were pulling the cart, and they got down on the road because there was a little hissing dragon up in front of them. And this, uh, the man actually had a rod with him at the time. It was actually a small creature, and he came up and whacked it on its head and killed it. And he brought the body into a, a naturalist at the time, Ulysses Andrevandus, who carefully studied the carcass and reported that it was unquestionably a reptile, one unlike any others he had seen. It had a very long, slender neck and a thick body. The description fits that of a Tanistrophius. So we think we might actually know what species it was from the description. What about the flying reptiles? Any uh, records of those? Well, we do have records of flying reptiles in recorded history. The Greek historian Herodotus uh, records an encounter with these winged serpents, flying reptiles. He says uh, he, he finds out about this, this place where there are lots of, lots of these uh, flying reptiles, which sound an awful lot like Ramphorhynchus, one of these small flying reptiles that had the long tail. And he goes to this valley to find out about them. He says, I went to learn about the winged serpents. When I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small and even smaller. Winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. And the legends say that the Egyptians used to worship the ibis birds because the ibis birds killed the Ramphorhynchus. The Ramphorhynchus were poisonous. So it did them a little service, and the Egyptians worshipped the ibis birds for that. He says the, uh, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered, but very like the wings of a bat. So he's going out of his way to say, this isn't a bird. It's not feathered. It's got wings like a bat, membranous kind of wings, and it's a, and it's a serpent, and therefore a reptile. Flying reptile, really amazing. 
But you know, it's not just uh, legends, it's not just historical accounts. We actually find some ancient drawings, some ancient paintings of dinosaurs. You probably know that some people in, in the past painted on cave walls, and they paint things like people and buffalo and dinosaurs. Did you know that? Here's some from uh, various places around the world, cave paintings of dinosaurs. Now, they've enhanced it a little bit for you on the PowerPoint, just so you can see it. But it looks an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur with the four legs and the long neck and the long tail. Here's one. I think this is from uh, Utah. Really amazing. In the 15th century, we have uh, Bishop Bell's tomb, Carlisle Cathedral. Now, we know this is from the 15th century. No one that we know when he died. So we know how old this is. This is before dinosaur fossils had really been found. Dinosaur fossils weren't found in bulk until really the 1800s. And if you, if you look on this tomb, there are these little brass strips along the side. And if we zoom in on those, we actually find that there are little animals carved in those strips. And some of those animals look like dinosaurs. They look an awful lot like sauropod dinosaurs. Really amazing, the different animals that they've carved into there. A lot of them are just animals that were alive today that you'd recognize, but some of them look a lot like dinosaurs. The Australian Aborigines painted this painting of a creature they think lives in Lake Galilee. They won't go near the lake because they're afraid of it. Interesting. Looks an awful lot like a plesiosaur, one of the, uh, not, not a true dinosaur, but one of the ones that had the flippers and lived in the, in the water. Lots of legends of lake monsters and things of that sort. You've probably heard of Loch Ness, but I think there are some better cases, really. There's a creature that's often reported in the Hawkesbury River near Sydney. There's a Yaru is the name for the Australian Aboriginal uh, creature. The Australian Aborigines also have a word called bunyip, which means monster, and their descriptions resemble bipedal dinosaurs that has walked on two legs, bi bipedal reptiles, possibly Tyrannosaurus or Allosaurus, one of those kinds. We don't know specifically what it would be. There are quite a lot of legends like that. Mokalian Bimbi is one that's quite popular to hear about. There's, there's a legend of a large creature that lives in the African Congo, and eyewitness reports are as recent as 1990. The descriptions and sketches resemble a sauropod dinosaur. Now, again, you know, we can't be sure. We can't be sure that these are accurate because we don't have a photograph of this, and as nice as that would be. But it is interesting that these things might have lived very, very recently, much more recently than a lot of people think. Makes you wonder even if some of these might even be alive today. And evolutionists say, oh, no way could dinosaurs be alive today. But wait a minute. Here I have a picture of a Wallamai pine. This is a particular pine tree that is found in the same layers of rock as dinosaurs. It's supposedly millions of years old by evolutionist reasoning. And they thought that it had gone extinct millions of years ago. Well, guess what? They're still alive today. They found them in some remote places in Australia. They're still alive. It's like finding a living dinosaur, they said. Now, it's a tree, though. A tree can't run away and hide, and yet it evaded detection until recently. Do you think it's possible there might be some creatures that we haven't discovered? See, an evolutionist might dismiss that out of hand, but a creationist can say maybe. Maybe. And, of course, there are a lot of things that evolutionists say lived at the time of the dinosaurs, like crocodiles that are alive today, and coelacanths, a kind of fish, that they're, they're, were thought to have been extinct for millions of years. They're still alive today. So it makes you wonder. Of course, many kinds of dinosaurs, and perhaps all of them, are extinct. And people ask, well, why did they die then? Why did the dinosaurs die off? Well, there are lots of reasons why things die off. And if you think about it, it's not just the dinosaurs. Lots of things have gone extinct since creation. As far as we can tell, there aren't trilobites around anymore. And they were apparently once abundant on this earth. Why do things go extinct? Well, it could be disease, it could be famine, hunted to extinction. That's, that's one that people don't think about for dinosaurs, but I, I read a lot of reports, a lot of legends of heroes going out and slaying dragons. Maybe we hunted some kinds to extinction. That's something to think about. And, of course, there are changes in environment. There are lots of reasons why things go extinct. Now, today we have endangered species programs to protect some of the animals that are on the verge of extinction. Maybe we didn't start those programs soon enough. Maybe the dinosaurs would still be around today if we had, if we had endangered species programs in the past. But in, in any case... Ultimately, the reason dinosaurs went extinct, ultimately the reason things die is because of sin. And now all the world, all the creation suffers and groans under that bondage of corruption and awaits deliverance from that bondage of corruption. And so you see, really, dinosaurs point to the gospel message, don't they? They remind us that we live in a cursed, fallen world. The reason these wonderful animals that God created for us to enjoy, the reason they're not around anymore is because we rebelled against him, is because we didn't want to play by his rules. And he backed away and removed a little bit of his sustaining power. And it's because that we live in a world that's separated from God by sin that we need a way back to God. And that way is Jesus Christ who took our pain, who took our penalty for sin on the cross. So you see, when you start from the Bible and you use the Bible to explain dinosaurs, it makes sense. There's not a mystery. The Bible makes sense of dinosaurs. And we can sum it up. We can sum up the biblical history of dinosaurs with the five F's. We talked about the seven C's of history. Here's the five F's of dinosaurs. They were formed 
back at creation, God made these wonderful creatures, some of them gentle giants, some of them very small. But in any case, these wonderful creatures for us to enjoy. Originally, they were vegetarian. The Bible makes that very clear. Fallen, because Adam sinned. The world fell. Adam fell. And the dinosaurs became corrupted along with everything else. All nature groans under that bondage of corruption. There was the flood. And undoubtedly, a lot of the fossils that we find today, probably the bulk of them, were laid down during Noah's flood. But there were representative kinds of dinosaurs on board that ark. And so they would have survived as Genesis kinds. They faded. The numbers of dinosaurs diminished after the flood at, at some point until there are very few and possibly none left. And finally, they were passed down only in memory. And maybe some of those memories got exaggerated a bit. And people combined different aspects of various kinds of extinct reptiles. And finally, they were found. Dinosaurs were rediscovered in the 1800s, uh, really the first fossils found around then. So you see, when you start from the Bible, when you view the world through biblical glasses, it makes a lot of sense. When you start from the Bible and you use that to understand dinosaurs, it fits. It makes sense. And that's really what we're all about at Answers in Genesis. We're about reconnecting the Bible to the real world. We want to show people this book is not just a collection of interesting stories. It's true. It happened. And you see, you can make sense of the world if you start from this book. If you start from God's Word, it makes sense. And I want to continue to encourage you to trust in the authority of God's Word. Thank you. Dr. Jason Lyle graduated summa cum laude from Ohio Wesleyan University, where he double majored in physics and astronomy and minored in mathematics. He did graduate work at the University of Colorado, where he earned a master's degree and a Ph.D. in astrophysics. In Dinosaurs and the Bible, Jason shows clearly and convincingly how the foundational truths of the Word of God can help us uncover many of the mysteries of our age, including dinosaurs. In this fascinating video, viewers will discover that contrary to popular belief, dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago, but were in fact the contemporaries of man. Dr. Lyle challenges his audience to embrace the truth of Scripture and the salvation message contained within its pages. Well, thanks again for coming out. I am Dr. Jason Lyle, a speaker and research scientist with Answers in Genesis. And I want to talk to you today about dinosaurs and the Bible. And I have to admit that this is a really fun talk for me because I've always loved dinosaurs since I was a little kid. And we find that most kids really get excited about dinosaurs. Now, a lot of people actually equate dinosaurs with evolution because our culture has used dinosaurs in an attempt to get people to believe in millions of years of evolution. 
But what I want to show you today is that when you start from the Bible, dinosaurs make a lot of sense. And in fact, we can actually use dinosaurs to get people excited about the Bible really being the Word of God and really giving us the true account of history. And I found that this is just a great way to advance the years, a slow, gradual process. That's how we're going to interpret the data. But if we start from Scripture, if we start from the true history that God himself has given us, an eyewitness to creation after all, then we're thinking in terms of biblical history. God created the universe, creation. It was a paradise. It was a perfect world, and he gave us dominion over that world and said you can either be for me or against me, and we effectively rebelled against God, said we want to play by our own rules, and that was the corruption. Sin entered that world and ruined paradise. God then judges sin in the catastrophe, Noah's flood. God judges sin. He's righteous, but he made a way of escape for Noah and for anyone who would trust in him. Then there was confusion, the confusion of tongues of the Tower of Babel. The people had united in rebellion against God, and so God divided them up into the various people groups. And then Christ, God himself, took on the additional nature of a human being, stepped into history, and paid the penalty for sin on the cross. And in the future, the final sea of history, consummation, the world will once again be a paradise in the future because of what Christ did on the cross. So if you're thinking in terms of biblical history, if we start from Scripture... What can we conclude about dinosaurs? Well, again, I like to think about this like wearing mental glasses. We call these the biblical reality glasses. When we look at dinosaurs, what do we see starting from Scripture? So put on your biblical reality glasses, and let's see what we can conclude about dinosaurs starting from Scripture. Well, dinosaurs, they're land animals by definition. They're reptiles that walked on their legs. Therefore, they were created on day 6 of the creation week, and we know that from Genesis 1, 24, and 25. Starting from scripture, we know that the land animals, all the land animals, that would include the dinosaurs, were made on day six. And this is a very basic form of logic called a syllogism. Follow this. T-Rex is a land animal. Land animals and man were created on day six. Therefore, T-Rex was created on day six. That's pretty easy, isn't it? And so dinosaurs, therefore, are not millions of years old. They lived beside man, contrary to what we've been taught. Dinosaurs lived with people. So maybe it looked something like this. But uh, in any case, people say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You, got, you got a T-Rex in the Garden of Eden. Wouldn't that T-Rex try to eat Adam and Eve? I mean, I've seen Jurassic Park, and they look pretty mean. See, a lot of people get their ideas about how animals behaved, surprisingly, from Hollywood fiction, which I find rather sad, really. People think that God made these horrible monsters because they see, they see Hollywood fiction. But if you think about it, is Hollywood really trying to tell an accurate story or is it trying to tell an entertaining story? That's really what it's trying to do, isn't it? And if you think about it, if dinosaurs had survivalized, especially to youngsters who get interested in God's word through science, really. Now, a lot of the times when I do these talks on creation, one of the questions that I get asked is, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And my answer to that question, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible, is actually you don't. Because when people are asking, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible, they're really asking, how do I fit what I know about dinosaurs into the Bible? How can I make it fit? How can I interpret God's word to allow for dinosaurs? You see, that's the wrong direction, isn't it? We don't want to start with what we know to be true, what we think we know to be true, and fit that back into God's word. Not at all. We want to start with the word of God. We're going to use the Bible to explain dinosaurs. We start with the Bible. That's the, that's the premise. That's the way to start. You see, we all have a way of looking at evidence. We can either look at the world through evolutionized glasses, millions of years of slow, gradual processes, or we can look at it through what God has said about the world. We can look at it through the lens of Scripture. And how we look at the evidence will be affected by our views of the past. If we think that the world evolved slowly over millions of years, that's what we're going to tend to see in the same way that a person wearing red glasses sees red everywhere. It's not that the world is red, it's that that's what they see because they're wearing those glasses. Well, if we think in terms of millions